Hello and welcome. My name is Matthew Lesh and I'm the Head of Research at the Anna Smith Institute. I'm excited to be joined today by Peter Jaworski of Georgetown University. We're going to discuss his latest paper, Bloody Well Pay Them, the Case for Volunteer Renumerated Plasma Collections. Uh, this is the latest Anna Smith Institute paper that we've co-published with our partners at the Miss Cannon Centre, the Australian Taxpayers Alliance and Weightless Zero. Uh, Peter is a Canadian who received his PhD in philosophy from Bowling Green State University. He also has an MSc from the London School of Economics, where I also have an MSc from. Uh, and he also has an MA in philosophy from the University of Waterloo. Um, he's been extensively published across academic journals as well as frequently quoted in the media. Welcome, Peter. Thanks very much, Matthew. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. My pleasure. So look, we're here today to talk about a paper about blood plasma, but I think for a lot of people, let's just, let's just get back to the basics. What is blood plasma? How does it differ from blood collection? What is going on here? Why does it matter so much? Why have you, why have you spent all this time dedicated to this topic? Okay, so blood plasma is a part of your blood, right? Your blood consists of like red cells, white cells, as well as the yellow liquid that's called blood plasma. Inside of your blood plasma are a whole bunch of different proteins and uh, maybe most importantly, a number of antibodies. Those antibodies are called immunoglobulins. And what we can do is we can take out the plasma from people through a process called plasmapheresis. Uh, this is important for this as well because it takes about an hour and a half with about 40 minutes sitting in a chair to do plasmapheresis, to give blood plasma. That's different from an ordinary blood donation. An ordinary blood donation takes about 30 minutes, right? Maybe 40 minutes, something like that. Uh, the needle goes in, it goes out, it's a really quick process. Blood plasma takes longer. Uh, you have to sit there in the chair and what happens is uh, the blood, all of your blood gets taken out of your veins. It goes into a machine called a plasmapheresis machine. That machine spins the blood and it separates the plasma from the rest of the blood components. The rest of those blood components go back into you and then they keep the plasma. Um, uh, actually, I have, look at this. I have, uh, uh, this is the bottle that the blood plasma goes into. Right? So that's not any blood plasma in there. You're not, you're, not, you're not hoarding blood plasma, are you, Peter? No, absolutely not. But see how large the bottle yeah. is? That's a, that's a lot of plasma that they yeah, take yeah. out of you. And what do we use it for then? So we, we take this plasma out of you, we've got those antibodies. What, 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 what medical use is that? So inside your blood plasma are, like I said, immune globulins, but also albumin and also coagulation or clotting factors. And we can isolate and concentrate those specific proteins. And then those are useful against a wide uh, array of different um, uh, problems, medical problems that people have. Um, amongst the more important of these is primary immunodeficiency. So some people don't produce their own antibodies or they have uh, not enough of like specific types of antibodies. And so they use this treatment, it's called immunoglobulin, uh, in order to lead more or less a normal life. And actually, it's important now, perhaps more than ever, because it is very likely that um, one of these immunoglobulin treatments, a hyperimmune, right, will be effective against the novel coronavirus, right? This is why this issue is as urgent as it is right now, because if it turns out that this will be a good treatment, right, we take convalescent plasma, those people have uh, created antibodies against this novel coronavirus, and then we can isolate and concentrate those and then use them on people who have uh, who are suffering from coronavirus, right? So that's going to increase the demand for plasma all over the world. Yeah, and, and it's already being uh, tested a few times in a few small-scale studies. And I understand the NHS in England is currently testing blood plasma. In fact, our health secretary over here, Matt Han Hancock, was making a, a call for people to start donating their blood plasma. But even before this, we've seen um, increasing demand for blood plasma. You write in the paper about 6 to 10% a year. What, why is there this, this huge increases in demand? Are we finding more uses for blood plasma? Is it, is it something that's uh, even before COVID has been becoming more useful? Yeah, even before COVID, uh, the demand for immunoglobulin was growing at about six to 10% per year. And yes, the reason why is because there are more and more indications that immunoglobulin is good against. We are finding more and more uses for immunoglobulin, but also the other kinds of medicines that we can make for plasma. So that's growing at 6 to 10% per year. Meanwhile, domestic collections of plasma in countries that don't, um, that don't permit remuneration or compensation for donors, those are increasing, if they are, at around 2 to 5% per year. New Zealand, for example, has set a target of increasing domestic plasma collections by 5%. But that means that every single year, there's a shortfall. 
and yeah. we are seeing greater and greater shortages. Yeah, and, and already, I mean, you guys can report how uh, the UK already imports 100% of the blood plasma it's been using. Um, uh, Canada, 84%. Australia, only over half of 52%. And New Zealand, at 13%. Uh, I suppose the essential question then becomes, where does all this blood plasma come from? Uh, where are we managing to import this from? Who's, who's the net exporter of blood plasma to the world? Who's the, who's the giver of this? Uh, uh, some people call it yellow gold, don't they understand? Yeah, the short answer is the United States. The United States provides 70% of the entire world's plasma used to make this plasma-derived medicinal product. Now, the longer answer is that Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Czechia, these are the other countries that permit some form of compensation for plasma donations. They also contribute to the global supply, such that like, if you combine those five countries that I mentioned, right, if you combine those five countries altogether, they provide 89% or nearly nine-tenths of all the plasma used around the world. And the reason why they can export plasma, the reason why they have enough for all of the patients in their own countries and can help patients in the United Kingdom, in Canada, where I'm from, in New Zealand, in Australia, and all over the world, is precisely because they allow remuneration for plasma donors. And so, so what's the basis of, of uh, not remembering people? So as you've said, uh, the UK doesn't remember people, Canada doesn't, uh, New Zealand doesn't, Australia doesn't, most countries don't. Um, where does that come from? Where does that idea come from? I think you, you talk a bit about the World Health Organization's Melbourne Declaration, which is actually my home, my home city. So uh, not the best place to uh, call this declaration out of. But what was the logic behind not remunerating people for blood plasma? Yeah, so the primary reason why, it's an antiquated reason, but back in the 1980s, we had a, a, a blood scandal, a, a tragedy that affected people, not just in Canada, but all over the world. Also, it affected people in the United Kingdom as well. There is currently an ongoing, um, uh, it's not a legal court case, but they are discussing the consequences of what happened in the 1980s uh, with, um, with some tainted blood. And in particular, there was tainted factor eight. Product factor eight is a clotting factor made from plasma. Uh, that plasma was taken from uh, basically prisoners in the United States, right? And back in the 1980s and the 1990s, we didn't have the kinds of treatments that we have now with respect to like what we can do with that plasma. Back in the 1980s, we didn't, for example, use heat treatment. And heat treatment is effective against HIV. We also didn't use solvents and detergents, which we use now. We also didn't use nanofiltration. Uh, we use UV lights at the moment, which, uh, which also kill a lot of the viruses that, uh, that might be present in the plasma. The issue that happened in the 1980s raised these concerns about safety. The World Health Organization had been pushing voluntary non-remunerated blood donations and they consider plasma donations the same thing as a blood donation, which it isn't, by the way. They've been pushing it, and they have this, his, this long history of doing that. However, like I said, and like you know, the entire world depends on paid plasma for the plasma therapies that we use. Right? The entire world now knows that whether you get the plasma from a donor who is paid or from a donor who is not paid, the plasma therapy that is made from that plasma is just as safe. It is equally safe. There has not been a transmission of any virus or any infection in over 25 years of use of these plasma therapies made with paid plasma. Over 25. We're talking about millions of uses, millions upon millions of uses. Uh, so this concern about safety, which motivated the push towards voluntary non-remunerated blood donations, this is an antiquated concern. It was a very real concern back in the 1980s. It is no longer a concern. But of course, the irony here is that literally we are paying for blood plasma. We're just not doing it domestically, of course. So uh, Australians or, or Brits or Canadians are happy for American donors of blood plasma, but they're not happy to do that domestically. Look, I have no, no issue with global trade and, and you know, uh, Americans exporting blood plasma, but I just find it ironic that these industries can't exist domestically in other countries. Uh, you also talk about, though, that the kind of broader moral implication of that is you have these relatively rich countries uh, beating up the global cost of plasma um, that actually means most people who could potentially use uh, blood plasma treatments in poorer countries can't really afford those kind of treatments uh, because the, the, the market is, is basically taken up by purchases in, in, by rich countries that, that don't remunerate domestically. 
Yeah, and this hasn't been discussed enough because you're exactly right. There's a very simple supply and demand dynamic going on here. You have essentially one country, the United States, that supplies all of this blood plasma. We don't have enough of these supplies in order to manufacture more and more of these plasma therapies, which would then result in a lower price for those plasma therapies. And then low uh, uh, and middle income countries could then possibly afford some of these treatments. We don't talk about the humanitarian aspect of this enough. Uh, Canada, um, like we said at the very beginning, Canada takes 80% of the global supply of plasma. Uh, excuse me, Canada relies 80% for its supply of plasma therapies on the United States. That's a lot of plasma that they're taking from that, from that one source, right? If Canada were to contribute to the global supply of plasma, you would have higher supply um, for the same amount of demand or the slowly growing demand, you should anticipate seeing lower prices. With lower prices, more countries, more people in, um, in developing nations could be able to afford these treatments that would save their lives. It's a, it's a tragedy. The World Health Organization estimates that there are approximately 1.4 million people who suffer from a primary immune deficiency and 75% of those people don't have access to the treatment that would help them live longer and healthier lives. Yeah, not, not to mention, of course, this, this issue is only going to get worse if this is a proven as a treatment against COVID. This is going to be yeah, an, a huge global demand, um, outstripping anything else that we currently know for these treatments against um, SARS-CoV-2. So would you expect kind of more shortages potentially in future and even higher prices um, as we're, we're trying to rely more and more on these paid donors out of America um, rather than uh, countries like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, uh, the UK that have the technological capacity, um, have the, the money to pay domestically um, to do so. Yeah, coronavirus is not only going to increase demand on this supply of plasma, it has also dampened the amount of plasma donations that people have given in the United States. It takes between seven to 12 months to make one of these plasma therapies. And my understanding is that there was a decrease of approximately 15% in plasma donations in the United States. So we should, um, we will see the impact of that decrease in supply seven to 12 months from now. So it is a possible, forthcoming crisis, say, really. Yeah, um, I should say, Matthew, that it is possible that there will be much more plasma donations beginning this month and next month to make up for the decline, the 15% decline in plasma donations. So it is possible that, that there won't be a shortage, but we have seen shortages before. In 2019, there was a shortage of immunoglobulin that affected not just the United Kingdom, uh, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, it also affected American patients. I find that surprising. Um, I find that something that like, people should discuss. America is supplying the whole world, and yet patients in America have to put up with shortages. That seems, that seems unfair, right? It seems unfair that the United States supplies the world, and yet American patients sometimes have to suffer through shortages. The United Kingdom has suffered through shortages um, uh, quite often, not just in 2019, but before that as well. I anticipate we will see more and more of this in the future, unless Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom get their act together and permit what I call voluntary remunerated plasma collections. Essentially, they need to permit paying people for plasma. Well, why can't you just ask people to donate more? Why doesn't that work? Well, I've already said it's a, it takes about an hour and a half. You can ask. You can ask, and people do ask, and I ask. I say, you know, if you are in a position to donate plasma, please do so, right, even for free. However, it takes an hour and a half, Matthew, and, and more than that. We need you to donate plasma regularly. In mm. the United States, the average plasma donor gives 21.4 times per year. We can ask people and give them cookies and milk or muffins or whatever you do in the United Kingdom. Is there a risk though that if we, we start compensating people, we lose out those voluntary donors, that maybe there's some kind of compensating effect? Yeah, you raise a really important point because we still can't pay for blood because we can't do what I explained we do with plasma. We can't heat treat it. We can't use solvents and detergents. We can't use nanofiltration and so on. So we still are reliant on an unpaid blood donation. We, we need that. 
However, the experience in the United States, in Canada, uh, in Germany, uh, as well as in Czechia or the Czech Republic, right? In those countries, blood donations were unaffected by the introduction of paid plasma. Um, in fact, uh, you saw a slight increase in blood donations in Chechia after they changed the law back in 2008. And as a consequence of that law, they increased plasma donations seven times over wow. three years. There was a sevenfold increase in plasma donations in Chechia before and after that law and no change in whole blood donations. But it's also important, Matthew, that like, we don't need as much blood as we used to. Right? Patient blood management has gotten so good, you don't need a pint of blood every time you have a surgery anymore. Right? Um, and that means that we need blood less and less, but we still continue to need plasma. The plasma, yeah. I just want to unpack uh, just a few country-specific issues. Now, first of all, uh, we know the UK um, currently is 100% dependent on imports. And one of your uh, potentially more controversial recommendations is that UK should start collecting plasma again. And why do you think, it, what's the, just the background there when it comes to the uh, potential risk and, and why do you think that risk is no longer there? Right, so the United Kingdom decided to stop all plasma collections for purposes of manufacturing these plasma therapies back when you had the variant Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease or mm. mad cow disease. Yeah, mad right? cow, yeah. So the UK decided to stop collecting all plasma for that reason, okay? Um, however, um, that was out of an abundance of caution since nobody had received this disease from a plasma therapy. And even to this day, no one has received that disease uh, from this particular, uh, from the plasma therapies made from plasma. And, and isn't it amazing as well, um, as our, our partners, the Australian Taxpayers Alliance have been quite interested in, that, that not only is it a way to ensure the delivery of blood plasma, but there's actually much cheaper to remunerate people rather than asking people to volunteer to donate blood plasma. What, why is that, Peter? So uh, there was a Health Canada expert panel that was convened back in 2017. They issued a report in 2018, and they estimated that uh, paid plasma is two to four times cheaper wow. than collecting unpaid plasma. Uh, the economist Robert Slonim from the University of Sydney, he has estimated that Australia could save $200 million every single year if they just imported plasma from the United States. And that might strike you as counterintuitive at the beginning until you think about it this way, right? A large part of the cost of blood and plasma collection is donor recruitment and retention. You have to make phone calls. You have to ask people. You have to remind them to like donate blood and donate plasma. And plenty of people are getting paid to do that, of course. It's not like there's no money in this field in the first place. Oh, uh, so um, you... For donor recruitment or remuneration uh, on the side of the uh, of the people that don't pay plasma, uh, don't pay donors for their blood or plasma, right? They have to spend a lot of money on marketing, on recruitment efforts, and so yeah. on, right? But if you pay somebody for plasma, that person, um, you don't really need to do a lot of marketing. You just explain you get like fifty dollars for donating plasma, and then people go in and they're motivated to come back when they can. So remunerated donors donate more frequently than non-remunerated donors. Uh, there's also a lot more of them. A lot more people participate in the system, right? They, they get to live up to their civic responsibility more because the number one thing that people who don't donate blood or plasma say when they're asked, like, why don't you donate blood or plasma? They say they can't afford it meaning they can't afford the time off work in mm. order to do this. They have other responsibilities, right? They simply don't have the resources in order to be able to dedicate two hours every single week for a whole year to give plasma for a cookie and, uh, and some milk, right? So it's two to four times more expensive and it's at least like two times um, uh, uh, less effective not paying people than remunerating them. Right. So it's a surprise that these countries decide to maintain this policy. Well, Peter, it sounds like there is an extremely strong moral case to pay people to donate plasma, to secure the supply, to save the taxpayers uh, money um, and ensure that we can say ultimately save lives from these treatments. Um, on, on behalf of the ASI and, and all our partner organizations, I just want to thank you very much for the work you've put in uh, to this paper and, and looking forward to continuing to to use the paper to, to make the case for this necessary policy change across the, the Kansas countries. 
Yes, thank you, Matthew. And let me say to the Kansas countries, bloody well pay them. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. You bet.